Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, we're in the book of Acts. FriendshipGraceBrethren.com documents if you want to download it. And there are some pictures in it, so, you know, for those of you that only like to look at the pictures, it's, it's worth getting. Gospel to the Gentiles, we're nearing the end of that. Matter of fact, we, I don't think we'll get to the end today, but we're getting close to the end of, of that section. And we're picking up where we left off last week in Acts chapter 10, verse 47. Um... Can anyone without water for baptizing these people who has received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Can with anyone withhold water for baptizing these people uh, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. So the, to refresh your, your memory of, of where we're at, Peter is... Uh, is in Joppa now with, uh, with Cornelius. We think Cornelius may have been what is termed the first spear, um, the, the senior um, commander of the, of the legion um, or the century of, uh, of Roman troops that we believe is called the Italian Regiment. And the Italian regiment is a specific, in today's parlance, we'd say they are a special forces unit assigned direct to the, to the uh, um, emperor. They, they work specifically for the emperor, not for the nation, but for the emperor. And uh, we believe that the Italian regiment was assigned there in, uh, in, the, in the region, in the Middle East region, the Levant, in order to keep the peace. And if Cornelius is the leader of that large group, he is uh, uh, the highest ranking uh, person that, up to this point uh, in the Roman government that uh, has come to know the Lord. And so he, he is led to the Lord by Peter. And, uh, and then we pick up where we are today um, as, as Peter asks, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Who is Peter referring to just as we have? Jewish Christians, yes. Because we have this situation now where we are beginning to see Gentiles come to know the Lord and not just Jews. And Jews were receiving the Holy Spirit um, at baptism. Remember, the book of Acts is a transition book. At the beginning, we see the Holy Spirit being given um, often through the, through the act of baptism. But by the end, the Holy Spirit is indwelling as soon as, as you're saved, like it is for us now. And so we're in this transition, and I think God did that on purpose. Well, I shouldn't say I think that. I know he did it on purpose. But what's the purpose? The purpose is for us to recognize that there are there are... There, there are no differences between how the Jew in the church age is being saved and how the Jew, or how the Gentile is being saved, and that he was transitioning from one dispensation, the dispensation of law, to the, another dispensation, the dispensation of grace or the church age. So Peter asks the question, um, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, then they asked him to remain for some days. <coughs> so this picture brings up another, another, another kind of thought. Peter commanded them to be baptized, so he didn't do the baptizing. He commanded some of his associates to do the baptizing, or perhaps he baptized Cornelius and then allowed Cornelius to baptize the others. But Peter 
did the commanding and doesn't look like he did the baptizing. A lot of churches have gone away from, from any kind of potential like that, that it would have been only Peter um, or Paul or whatever, the, the pastor of the local church that would do the baptizing. Why? Why is this statement that he commanded them to be baptized, why is that important for us to consider? Important for the baptism to occur. But, but why, why, why would Peter, let me rephrase it a different way, why would Peter not want to be the baptizer of record? Just like Paul didn't. Schmuck? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> get the get the Yiddish in there. <laughs> yeah, I think that's exactly right. That Paul almost boasted that he didn't baptize any but it, but a couple of people, and and I think Peter was in that same position. Now, I don't want to be seen as the guy that baptizes because not that he didn't appreciate baptism. You know, he it was it was almost like a rule, and, and they did it. Uh, they were very good about doing it. But there seems like our human nature would attach to, to if you were baptized by Peter, who had been for three and a half years on the inner circle with Jesus, you know, you could just have that little bit of pride thing. Yeah, he'd do me one time backwards, and that wouldn't do me any good. <laughs> Well, some, some were, yes. Somewhere, yeah. Yeah, yeah can, can you imagine being the guy that Peter baptizes? And you go to have a discussion in church. Well, I'm, I'm a little bit closer to God because Peter baptized me. Can you just imagine how that... I mean, our egos are like that. We would do that. Trust me. We would do that. And so Peter here is... is is eliminating that before the uh, the beginning of this, uh, uh, before it really begins to be a, a, a real problem. So here's another question. As grace brethren who believe in the institution by Jesus on the mode of baptism that was specified by Jesus in Matthew 28, does this verse contradict it? Now I'll go back to the verse. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. As grace brethren who believe the instruction by Jesus on the mode of baptism was specified by Jesus in Matthew 28, which says, baptize them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Is Peter contradicting Jesus? Yeah. But remember, Luke was recording it based on the inspiration of, of, uh, of the Holy Spirit. So we can't say Luke's wrong. It would be easy, but it won't work because now we've now we've said that God's wrong, and that definitely doesn't work. Well, that's going to be the same answer. He's adding the safeguard. You mean Luke is, or Peter is? Well, Peter's only saying um, baptize in the name of Jesus. What's different about what we read in Matthew 28, baptizing in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and what, what Peter says in the, in the verse here? Right. That's the question then. Is Peter contradicting what Jesus said? See, a lot of people, will, a lot of fellowships, denominations, will point to verses like this, and, and argue this is why we only baptize one time. Jesus was before the transition. So 
So how do we how, how do we not say that Peter is is um, contradicting what Jesus said? Well, a lot of places do that too, but I'm not kind of I'm not that kind of guy. Is there a formula in what Peter is saying here? I mean, clearly in Matthew twenty eight nineteen, there's a formula, right? Make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do all the things that I've, I've taught you to do. But Peter doesn't seem to be giving a formula here. In the name of Jesus. But that's not a formula, is it? It's, it's a completely different grammatical structure than Matthew 28. Peter is not saying, dunk once in the name of Jesus. Remember, baptize means immerse. Baptize doesn't mean pour, doesn't mean sprinkle. It means immerse or drown or potentially hold under. So Peter is saying, and he commanded them to immerse them in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I, I, th I think that there's, there's some real legitimacy to that. Peter is not giving a formula here. He, the, the in the name is, is kind of a euphemism for saying because of. Kind of, yeah. Um, he, he is not giving a formula. We only have one baptismal formula given in all of Scripture, and that's in Matthew 28, 19. This is not a formula. This is just saying, because of the work of Jesus Christ and because of their commitment, shorthand, as Steve said, baptize them. Right. Get her done. Get her done. That, this, this is not a contradiction of what Jesus said, despite what a lot of churches want you to believe. There's only one place that we find a true systematic formula for baptism. And even the churches that would, would bank on, on a statement like this, and there are a number of them in the New Testament, they still baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but only doing it once. So it's, it's, an, interesting, and it's an interesting way around the, the text. Yes. The words are, are, are there in the name of, um, but, but the, the, way it, the way it's structured, it, it's not giving you a, formula, a formulaic system to, to do it. Yes. So Peter's telling them that, uh, that there's no reason for the people to be baptized, and they should be baptized, and they've already received the Holy Spirit. And so then Peter hangs out with them uh, for a little while. Peter doesn't give any instructions on how the Jews were to baptize, just that they were to get her done. On to chapter 11, verse 1. Maybe. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticize him saying. So we'll get into the saying in just a little bit. There's a, there's a couple of things we need to, uh, to see here. Luke records for us in this chapter the beginning of the first major issue to challenge the church internally. The situation was for many, the Jews, even though they had become Christians, they didn't let go of their Jewish custom or their heritage including the custom and heritage that had been perverted by the Pharisees post-Babylonian exile. So what I mean there is the Jews had become so ardent keepers of the law that they couldn't allow for someone... The, the church was still seen as, a, as a, a, an offshoot of the, of the Jewish... Uh, practice. And so they couldn't allow someone to come in it 
unless they were going through the, the sacrificial, um, not sacrificial, the proselyting system that was intense, took a long time. It, it's kind of like becoming a citizen of the United States. It's harder for a person from the outside to become a citizen than it is for you to be born here. I mean, you guys never had to take a test to prove you were a citizen. I had to take a test. I had to pass a test. I had to actually have people attest to the fact that I had moral character. I'm tired today, so my, my, my filter is a little lower. So, becoming a proselyte Jew was much more difficult than being born a Jew. There are some scholars that say that uh, to become a proselyte, you had to memorize the Old Testament. Now, I think that's overblowing it. We, we have some other scholars that say to be a Pharisee, you had to memorize the Old Testament. But, I mean, it was still a big deal. I ain't doing it. I'm just now good at my address. So... When the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God, Peter went up to Jerusalem in the circumcision party. Who is that? Who's the circumcision party? Right. Right. They would be what we call by the end of uh, the book of Acts, and we're into the, uh, the Pauline epistles, they would, be call, they would be who we call the Judaizers that, that wanted to make people become Jews before they could be Christians. Um, I, we don't really have any evidence that they were a political party like Pharisees, Sadducees, Zealots, and so forth, but they may have been. And so what I, what I find really interesting is the word is beginning to spread in the apostles and the brothers, and probably the brothers means the, the elders, the Jerusalem elders. Who would have been in that group, in the Jerusalem elders? Yeah. No. James. James was one of the elders, probably the only really... The, the only elder we really know about in the Jerusalem church, James, the brother of Jesus. He was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He was not an apostle, but he was an elder, and he was the one that led, as we get into Acts 15, you'll see that, that he led the, the discussion in Acts 15. So who's, who's in view here are the apostles and the, and the leadership of the church in Jerusalem. It's still the idea of the mother church. Okay? So, the, uh, so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Didn't think that's where it was going, did you? So these are, these are real Jews keeping the... The, the law, the best they could, and one of the laws was that they weren't to eat with uncircumcised. With, I mean, how do you check, right? I mean, to me, this, my mind just doesn't work there. It is, it is very, it's not kind of strange, it's very strange. Well, no, that's the job of the young priest to determine. You went to the uncircumcised, to the, to the Gentiles... And you ate with them. What's, for the Jewish mind, what's wrong with that? Maybe, but probably not. Why? That, that is what the, the Pharisees taught. But why would anybody in, a, in the Jewish world have a prohibition against eating with Gentiles? Right, but focus on the eat, or in this point, ate. Exactly. 
So when, when Peter went to the uncircumcised and ate with them, he accepted them for who they were. He accepted them, including their way of life. And the Jews that were just fixated on, on God's teaching of separation, by Peter doing that, he was accepting Gentiles without any kind of thought about how they would disrupt everything else. In typical church fight fashion, their frustration was not over Peter preaching to the Gentiles or even to the Gentiles that the Gentiles were being saved. The real issue was that Peter eats with them. Based on the perverted law, the Pharisees had made a big deal over Jews eating with Gentiles because they were unclean. And by eating with them, you were accepting them. So Peter goes into a little bit of a response here. But Peter began and explained to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. And he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. So Peter begins to, to tell the, the Judaizers what had actually happened. He responds to the accusation by some of the Jews by recounting to them just exactly what had happened. So what's the, the question is, what's the purpose of Peter recounting all of these events? Yeah, he was directed by God. Uh, it, you could almost hear in the background, you know, Peter is that guy with the foot-shaped mouth. So you can hear kind of in, the, in what Peter is saying here. Just who do you think you are to stand in the way of what God is doing? And so Peter laid out for them just very clearly... Look at what God did. He gave me an example that the entirety of the world has potential to be saved. That there, It's not just Jews only that will be saved. It's the entire world. And then he sent people who had been told by, by an angel or by a messenger from God that Peter can give you the message of the gospel and, you, and by it you will be saved in your whole house. And so Peter, is, it's almost like he's saying, just who do you think you are? Why do you want to get in God's way? Which I can't imagine went over well with uh, the Jews. But Peter continues on. Peter doesn't continue on. He's taking a pause. You and all your household? Yeah, that does, that's not what that says. But the same thing, we... Right. I mean, that's... Right, it's not saying that Cornelius will be saved and thereby his household will be saved. He's saying that Corn... Corn... Yeah, that guy, Corny, and his whole entire house will be saved. Same thing happens in the, uh, in the uh, Philippian jailer. You know, Paul preaches to the Philippian jailer, and he's saved in his entire house. Um, if you were to go to Goshen, Indiana today and ask Jim Brown what the strategy is for winning a city, he would say, get the fathers saved, and the wives and children will follow. And I think that's the principle that's being developed there. Well, 
Yeah, it, it's, it's not. And you were going to say? Well, let, let's go back to a Norman Rockwell family. Dad, mom, three kids. And an angel comes, whether that be Jesus as messenger, the resurrected Jesus as messenger, as some teach, or a true angel. And, but, but clearly, an, a, 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 a spiritual being is standing in, in, your, in the middle of your house. Norman Rockwell, dad, mom, three kids standing there. And they see this. And they say, send people down to Joppa and, and get, bring Peter up, and Peter's going to teach you about salvation. And Norman Rockwell, dad and mom and three kids are standing there. They hear this. Peter gets there three days later. They hear what Peter has to say. Norman Rockwell, dad, mom, three kids. They all hear it. The potential for all of them to come to know the Lord at the same time is pretty good. Particularly since Peter was told, they all would be saved. So how can God do that? How can God determine beforehand that all three would be, or all five, or whatever the number was, would be saved? Yeah, because he, he chose them, or not. Right, exactly. That's how I think this is intended to be seen. That they were, they were being led by the Holy Spirit to seek and Peter came and filled the, their questions, and, uh, and they all turned to him. And I think in the same way, the Philippian jailer was led to the Lord, and that resulted in his entire family being saved. Not that they were being saved because of the jailer, but with the jailer. Answer. Uh-huh. Sure. Yeah, the power lunch was just out. Yeah, in in the ancient Near East, having having a meal with someone was was accepting them and was was uh, approving of them. So there there probably weren't a lot of business lunches between Jews and Gentiles. they would have to become ceremonially clean before they could go to the temple. But just their daily life made them unclean. So it's not a big deal that they were unclean after dealing with Gentiles. But remember, the way the Lord had begun to teach it when they were still in the wilderness wandering is when you come out of Gentile territory in, back into Israel, you have to knock the dirt of the Gentile world off your feet. Don't, don't contaminate the holy ground of 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 Israel with the dirt of the Gentile world. Well, you can see how that's going to get get uh, um, amplified and abused, and, and the separation. I mean, the Jews hated the Samaritans because they didn't do that, because they were now half Jews and half Gentile. Oh, sure, there were. Yeah, the, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because all throughout the Old Testament, there are instructions on how you're to treat the sojourner in, in your land. Yeah, there were lots of Gentiles in there. That's correct. Yeah, Peter wasn't. Well... I shouldn't say he wasn't. There were times that he was. In the Apostle Paul, you're reading the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul actually confronts Peter about it. Because Peter was hanging out with the Gentiles in the book of Galatians until another Jew came around. I can't be with you. And he, and he went just to the Jews. And, and Peter said, what are you doing? That's not the way to live. That's not proper. And so, you know, I, I say he's not a Judaizer. He was sometimes. But most of them weren't. But there was a strong 
grouping of them coming out of Jerusalem. We first see the real, or I mean, we're beginning to see it here. Acts 15, we have the real confrontation. But all throughout the, uh, the Pauline epistles, Paul is dealing with the effects of the Judaizers. It became a, it became a constant source of problems to the early church. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's almost certain. Because we know there were a number of Pharisees that came to know the Lord. And so if, if, we, if there are some, you would have to believe that, that there were others that came to know the Lord that continued in their, in their pharisaic, pharisaical way. But remember... I don't believe that all the Jews that became Christians stopped being Jews. They didn't stop their sacrifices. They didn't stop keeping kosher. They, they just didn't mandate it for the rest of the world, the Gentiles. They continued to be Jews. We know this because the Apostle Paul, late in his life, matter of fact, it's what got him arrested and sent to, to Rome uh, and where he, he spent two years in prison in Caesarea and then several years in prison in Rome, was because he was keeping a vow, um, a, a Nazarite vow, and he paid for three others to keep a Nazarite vow. And the, the other Pharisees, who now were pretty angry with Paul, Saul, said he brought Gentiles into the temple, and for that he was arrested. And eventually he appealed to Rome, and that's how he got how he got to go to Rome. So we know he was continuing to keep his, uh, his Jewish practices up. So Peter go, continues on in his uh, defense of what happened. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. What's that a reference to? Pentecost, exactly. And I remembered that the... I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, go. Right. Okay, that's eleven seventeen, right? Okay, 11.17 says, If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Verse 19 now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of the, uh, some of the men of Cyprus and Cyrene who, on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. So we have, we have two groups, we have two things happening, two groups of, of, of Jewish Christians. Some are preaching only to Jews, and some are now beginning to reach out and, and preach to, uh, to Gentiles as well. Peter makes a big deal of saying that God gave them the same gift that we receive, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at salvation time. In the early part of the book of Acts, in the early transition, it came at different times. Uh, when the Jewish Christians heard the full account of, of Peter especially the fact that the Holy Spirit was given to the Gentiles, they praised God and no longer had any issues with what God is doing. Now, this group that Peter is talking to are apostles and elders from the church in, in, uh, in Jerusalem. So they no longer had any issues with this. That doesn't mean there weren't issues by others. As we read later on, there were lots of people that had issue with this. Uh, Luke is beginning to set the stage for the movement of the evangelist efforts, which had been focused primarily on the Jews, but was now 
about to break out to more than the Jews, including what we read here. Men of Cyprus and Cyrene who were coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenist also, preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, it's interesting. Hellenist is a word that, that clearly means Greek. I mean, it is actually where we get the idea of, of, uh, of the Greek world. But we're not certain. I mean, context gives you a, a hint that Hellenist is being used here to speak of Gentiles, not Jewish, Gent, uh, not Jewish uh, um, Greeks. Remember there was early on in chapter 6, the same word is used to refer to Greek Jews. But here the context seems to be saying just Greeks, not Greek Jews. It's a little, little bit difficult to, uh, to say. We have in, uh, in this verse the first reference to Antioch in Syria, which uh, would soon factor as a very important city in the future growth of the church, particularly to the Gentiles. Antioch was the, the third largest city in the Roman Empire behind Rome and Alexandria. Antioch is today the Turkish city of uh, Antakya, and I don't know where it is, uh, on the northeast Mediterranean coast. It's right down here. This little piece. We, we've been seeing a lot, of, uh, a lot of ISIS struggle and so forth in Aleppo. Aleppo, it's right here. Antioch was right here. This, this city became the, the sending city for Paul and Barnabas. It became one of the two primary church sending places in the early church. Alexandria, Egypt was the other. And you might recall that Christianity was developing differently in both locations. In Antioch, it, was, it, is, it is where we begin to see the, the, uh, the hermeneutic of Scripture like, like we use, the, uh, you know, I can't all of a sudden think of the words, the historical grammatical uh, interpretation of Scripture. Where if a word means this, that's what it means, unless there's a reason to say it means something different. So you use what the historical grammatical way of, of using a word is. In Alexandria, which would be down here on the, on the Egyptian coast, um, it became one of the largest Christian uh, or, uh, cities as well. But it had a whole different hermeneutic. It was all about allegorizing scripture. It was all about, well, yeah, that doesn't really mean this, it means that. And if you, if you focused on the way Alexandria taught scripture, you could make scripture say just about anything. Exactly. And you, you know, because of that, you, you have these two competing interests. I mean, we, we are only, by 60 years in of the church, we have these two competing cities that are, are completely different in their approach to teaching Scripture, and church history is, is then spent following one or the other. They become very important places. But this is where we really see the beginning of, uh, of Antioch being a, a, a ascending place. And uh, we'll, we'll see that more as we, as we move on. Men from Cyprus and Cyrene came to Antioch and began to preach. The, men, the identity of these men is not specifically get, given, but some believe that Barnabas may have been one of these men from Cyprus. Barnabas was, was a Jew from Cyprus that ultimately was the one that, after Paul was saved, that got Paul involved in Antioch and got Paul involved in missionary journeys and went with Paul on the first journey. Luke doesn't specify uh, or state that Antioch was targeted because of its importance to the empire and because of its immorality, but in reading the text you get that, that sense. 
So we'll pick up there next week. Any questions on all that we've been through this morning? Well, it, it is uh, Antakya. It is a Turkish city. It is, it is very important to the Russians right now because they have a, 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 a navy base. Uh, the only real access they have to the Mediterranean is through that city. Um, they want to control that little piece of land that comes down from Turkey uh, into Syria. Syria and, and that part of the world are very important to them because otherwise they only can come through the Black Sea and traversing the Black Sea through Istanbul and through the, through the, the narrows there into the Mediterranean is not that easy. So having a navy base there gives them a presence. And so it's, it's, uh, it, is, it is not the center of Christianity. Yeah, well, Turkey, Turkey is a Muslim nation and getting more Muslim. Uh, getting more Muslim every day. They're losing the, 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 the president of, of Turkey, Erdogan. He, he is, he's not a religious Muslim, but he wants the power of the Muslim world. And so he's, he's turning his back on the West and really aligning himself with the Western world. I mean, the Eastern world. Today is the 17th. Any other questions? Thank you, Father, for allowing us to spend a little time looking at what you have for us in, in your text and the, the beginning of the spread of the gospel to the Gentile world. Thank you that you chose to, uh, to bring the gospel to the Gentile world as we all are a, a beneficiary of that. Give us a great time in the service to follow and that you might be honored and glorified and as we worship you and as we fellowship together and as we study your word. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.